Thanks for having us. Um, so like Lorena said, I'm with the Brain Center. We've been rocking and rolling for about six, seven years now. So we're still a newer organization in town. We're nonprofit and everything we do, we don't charge for. So our coaching that we'll talk a little bit about as well as our community presentations, a big part of our mission is to get out there and educate on what we can be doing for our brain health every single day. Um, we like to just uh, flash this up. All of our volunteers and our coaches happen to be retired physicians or individuals connected with the medical field, but we really like to be clear that although they're doctors, we're not your doctor, but what we try to do is plant seeds and share information for you to take back to your physician or your healthcare team because everyone's different and we want that. Um, whatever brain health means to you to be personalized to you because everyone is Likes, has different likes and abilities and interests, so um, just like to kind of put up that disclaimer about who we are as an organization. All right, what, what we do at the Brain Center. So our purpose is we are committed to making brains better at every age and generation. So we're working with littles at schools, and we're working with folks um, at all ages of life because we can proactively take care of our brain at any age. So we do that through a model of care. We um, collaborate. So we work with a lot of agencies you might be familiar with. Um, the ADRC downtown, uh, the CP Center, Curative Connections. Um, trying to think some of our other partners, the YMCA's, the Croc Centers, all those people who are focusing on health and, and the physicians in town, all the healthcare providers. We want to be a resource to them as well so they can send their patients to us. And um, we advocate, so we're really out there talking about um, how do we have healthy, productive conversations about neurodegenerative diseases. Sometimes there's some stigma associated with those. We want to take those barriers down. We want everyone to feel comfortable in our community, whether that's a disease process you're going through, whether you have relatives or a family member that are, but just making sure those individuals are included, understood in our community. And then we promote research. We, we're not a research center at the Brain Center. We're not doing clinical research right here in our office. But what we do is we research the research. So every week our volunteers and our coaches and our physicians get together and talk about different medications, talk about different therapies, talk about things that um, are, are making a difference because we want to better and better how we're taking care of these illnesses so we can prevent a lot of it. And then educate. So what we're doing today uh, what we do, Lorena, was uh, her position was supported by the community in, this past August. We were able to bring her on, and she does so much outreach and education in the community every day. That's her job, so we're thankful for the ability to do that. And then, there we go. All right, then she turns it over to me. So here we are. So you're thinking, well, what do we do? 
Uh, what Chris said, uh, the second is our community education, and that is the presentations. We go into small groups, we go into large groups like this, um, whatever the community would like to know about as far as presentations. So I did want to show our website because there is some confusion, like, well, what does the Brain Center do? What does coaching mean? It's going to be tailored to all of you individually, and it's going to be based around our six pillars. And that is the handout you have, and Dr. Luloff is going to dive into each of those six pillars today. So let me show you our website. So after today, you can feel free to poke around, and it's going to be green or braincentergb.org, and all of our information is on here. If you click on programs and services, and then we're going to go to personal coaching, and this is, as I mentioned, going to be tailored to you all individually. Uh, we see people that, you know, may, might think like, oh, I'm, you know, noticing some memory issues. Um, maybe I want to come in and chat about how my sleep is or what am I, what am I eating, my nutrition. So. It's really based on what each individual will need. And then, just so you can kind of see, you can go to our website and click on our coaches. So these are the volunteer coaches. Read a little bit about who they are and then what they do as far as um, for their coaching sessions. So like Dr. Luloff, you can see here, he likes to work with Parkinson's, movement disorders, and preventative brain health and exercise is one of his passions. And if you'd like, you can click right here on the link to schedule with him and book a session that way. Oops. I did, I clicked out. And then, Scrolling down a little bit, you can see our other coaches, so Dr. Gail Carrolls, um, what she specializes in is Alzheimer's, dementia, prevention, general health, she loves to talk about nutrition. Again, you can click there if you're interested in meeting with her. Uh, another coach is Kathy, she's a registered um, RN, retired, uh, works with Parkinson's, dementia, and she loves to talk about nutrition as well. And then we have um, Cheryl Williams, another volunteer coach, uh, she works more with the preventative wellness, and she likes to focus on sleep. And then Julie Button is one of our newer coaches, and she likes to work um, with preventative health, brain health, and then also um, traumatic brain injury. So any kind of maybe TBIs, or let's say there's um, some rehab from a stroke and that type of thing. So yeah, so feel free to go to our website again, uh, if free of charge, there is a um, very informal meeting that you would fill out a coach assessment with the individual, and uh, your coach and you would go through those six pillars of brain health. Any questions about that before I turn it over to Dr. Lula? And it might make a little more sense as we dive into everything, so, all right. All right, you're up. So you use the one that you have on that. Yeah. Test, test it and see if we can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I tend to talk loud. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm hard of hearing. And uh, if you uh, can't hear me, raise your hand. Save your questions till the end, but jot them down, uh, because uh, we're glad to stick around. And, uh, uh, if we haven't generated any questions, we aren't doing a good enough job up here. Because, uh, uh, if you're if you have good questions that fits with, with what we have messaging uh, I go by my slides <coughs> because my 81 year old brain sometimes stammers it says what am I supposed to say next and I don't want to forget the important things it's a real pleasure to be here I see a number of friends uh, and uh, uh, it, it's great to uh, uh, look back uh, 20 and 30 and 40 years uh, to when we would have had contact. Uh, so, 
I'm a Wisconsin kid, a Badger, born and raised in Dodgeville, southwest Wisconsin. The stuff that we're doing in the Brain Center really strikes home. Uh, uh, we have a strong family history of Alzheimer's. My mother died uh, with Alzheimer's at age uh, 76. Uh, both of her parents, my grandparents, died in their 80s with significant dementia, Alzheimer's. Uh, two of her, my mother's four sisters had Alzheimer's and died of it. And my only sibling, my brother, eight years older than I am, retired orthopedic surgeon, as I am a retired orthopedic surgeon, my brother died in a memory care unit at age 87 with advanced Alzheimer's disease. And I happen to have a genetic marker. Uh, one of the most important things we can do uh, to keep our brain healthy is to keep active. And uh, that's one of the things that drives me to be here. But that, wasn't, that didn't uh, take care of everything in our family. I met my wonderful wife, Annie. Her name was Ann, but I, our loving name was always Annie for her. Uh, she was uh, at UW-Madison, graduated. Uh, she was a year and a half older than I was. Uh, that uh, was perfect, because she could teach me everything I needed to, to know. Uh, and uh, she made sure that she told me what I needed to know. <laughs> so. Uh, but Annie um, uh, was working in the lab that summer, and then she was going to move to Milwaukee to be, she was a medical technologist, work in the hospital labs and do all sorts of testing and things like that. Um, I walked in, I was doing research in that lab that summer as I was just starting medical school. And Annie um, uh, walked in, uh, she was moonlighting in that lab, doing uh, cleaning up the test tubes. We, the, other medical student and I would make a horrendous mess and uh, she would come in and clean it up. I learned that day that this cute lady had a steady boyfriend. Uh, six weeks later, thanks mother. <laughs> uh, um, she, um, uh, I, I walked in to, to do lab work six weeks later uh, and the other medical student says, are you dating anybody? And I said, no. And she said, or he said, uh, you should ask Ann out. I said, oh, she's got a steady boyfriend. And he said, uh, no, they broke up last week. Well, I got nothing accomplished that day waiting for her to go <laughs> to four o'clock. And then she walks with her uh, Bermuda shorts and her white blouse that wasn't tucked in. And uh, I, we greeted each other, and I said, how would you like to go out and have a couple of beers tonight? And she gave me this dirty look. <laughs> and I thought, uh-oh. With that, the look changed to a smile. I think her angry look was just saying, who told you that I was to, or that I broke up? Uh, so uh, we went down to the pub on State Street, a uh, uh, college bar. Uh, each had three Heilman's exports. exports. Um, uh, we uh, talked nonstop. Walked back to her, uh, the apartment she was staying at, which is only two blocks from the hospital. Uh, and I, I looked at her, trying to figure out what I was going to say to her. With that, she uh, uh, said, might I expect that I would see you again? I thought, wow. I said, I'd like that. She said, so would I. And we embraced and kissed. 51 weeks later, we were married. <laughs> she taught me so much. Uh, uh, the first nine, nine of the 10 years that we were married uh, were in Madison. All three of our children were born there. I did finish medical school. She worked in the labs. And then uh, I did my orthopedic surgery residency at Madison. By that time, she could be a full-time homemaker and mom for the three little kids. Went into the Army for two years and came to Green Bay. So, Annie's story tells more about uh, the personal experiences. At age 36, we'd been in Green Bay for two and a half years. She lost her sense of smell. We didn't know what that was. Her doctors didn't know what it was. And she had panic attacks. 
and she had depression. This was a tough lady, wonderful mom, wonderful wife, uh, community active person. But what was going on? For the next 13 years, we dealt with that sort of stuff. And she had uh, uh, struggled on the tennis court. She was a wonderful tennis player. All of a sudden, didn't have the coordination. And at age 49, started to have the tremor and the signs of Parkinson's. So, for the next 31 years, from 40, from being 49 until 80 and a half, uh, we battled Parkinson's. And we made a difference. We made a huge difference. And a lot of the things that we made a difference on were just exactly what you're going to hear today. The six pillars dealing with that. Did we learn everything for sure? No, we didn't. We're still learning. We're all learning. That's what you're here for today. And there's so much that we need to pound into your head as much as possible to open the ideas of what we can all be doing. And this is not only for you, it's for your families, it's for your friends, it's for your kids, it's for your grandkids. We need to educate everyone in how to take care of our health, our, our brains, and make a difference. And we can do that. So, uh, next. So we founded the Brain Center um, about uh, six, seven years ago. Uh, Dave Donarski, retired psychiatrist, and I had known each other for a long time. And uh, I ran into him. I was out for a run, and he was out for a walk. And he said, how's Ann doing? And I said, well, she's in the dental chair up in that office building right there. He said, you know, we should meet the meet and talk about it. so much more can be done for all these disorders. I said, that's good. I said, how about next Tuesday morning? We've met every Tuesday morning that he's available and I'm available for the last uh, seven years. Pretty soon the word traveled to some people that we knew that had interest in brain disorders. So it became five of us meeting on Tuesday mornings on Betty Court, the Lulof home at the Round the Kitchen table. Why did we meet there? Because I was Ann's prime care partner, and she was would be would sleep in in the morning, so I could go back and check on her. And we got going, and we said, "Are we just going to talk about this, or are we going to make something happen?" We said, "We can do more." And so we we made the move, nonprofit. Uh, uh, did any of us know how to run a nonprofit? No. Uh, but you get to hire good people, get a good board of directors, and things flew. How much do we know now that we didn't know six and seven years ago? An awful lot. Not only in an administrative standpoint uh, and running a nonprofit, but getting the word out and looking at the science. The science is so critical, and uh, uh, very important. Can I help you with anything? No, it's fine. Okay. So, we are all different. We all have the chance and the responsibility to take care of ourselves. Our brains are phenomenally amazing. They're also automatic. Most of the things we do, we don't think about. This man right here grabs the picture. Does he think I've got to put my hand out and grab the picture? No, he wants the picture and he pulls it back. Your nose itches and you go like this. You brush your teeth in the morning, you say, well, some days you say, where is the toothpaste? Where is the toothbrush? Most of the time, you have it right where and you do things. Our brains are automatic. We breathe automatically. But every so often, we're short of breath and we say, oh, I have to take a deep breath. Uh, none of you, in the time you're going to be sitting there, are going to think about taking a good deep breath. But you know, taking a good deep breath supplies your brain with oxygen. So, right now, uh, while I'm talking, I want you to take five deep breaths. And continue, get your five done while I start talking again. Okay. And we need to keep moving. We need to do good sleep. 
We need to eat healthy. We need to avoid stress. And we need to avoid poisons and toxins, all of which can be bad for our brains. We don't want to wait until our brains are bad. Let's keep them healthy. It's far better to prevent problems and keep them healthy rather than have to deal with treating those challenges. So, our brains are phenomenal. Memory, yes. Thinking, yes. Our mood, you know, it helps to have a positive feeling. It helps to be enthused, it helps to be excited. Uh, an executive function is putting all the things together, thinking about what's the challenge today? What problem do I deal with? And Annie and I learned that. What's the challenge with the Parkinson's today? What's the problem? Okay. And do the things that we can make a difference. We can all make a difference with our lives, but we have to take that action. We have to be aware. So you're going to hear some facts and figures on that. So um, we are all different. Why are we different? Uh, the genes that we got from our parents are different. Our environmental exposures are different. You know, if you lived where it was polluted and you were uh, breathing in polluted air, uh, it could be a real problem. Uh, and our abilities and our needs are different. Uh, what each of you need to do for your exercise has to be fine-tuned for you. Uh, it has to be safe. It has to be uh, uh, understandable. Uh, and uh, I don't expect you to be a runner. Uh, but I, I, uh, I want you to be able to walk and keep moving and doing the things by knowing yourselves. Next. So, and right now, we are learning in healthcare about the amazing challenges that we're facing all of a sudden. In the first 20 years of the 19th century, or the, of the 20th century, from 1900 to 1920, the percentage of obesity and significantly overweight in the United States was 1%. Right now, I live in Alloy, the zip code 54301. Those of you who live on the west side, close. 54303. The incidence of significantly overweight or obese in uh, uh, adults is 40%. Is it any wonder that we have epidemics in heart disease, diabetes, uh, what's called a dysmetabolic syndrome, uh, but let's go back to number one, diabetes. Diabetes uh, is associated with insulin resistance. Insulin is what you give diabetics to get the blood sugars down, and, okay? Uh, <clears throat> insulin resistance has no symptoms. My family history. My father became insulin-dependent diabetic when he was 74. He was never overweight, he was always active, he was healthy, and uh, why did he get, become insulin-dependent? Then, my grandmother, his mother, became insulin-dependent diabetic when she was 84. Tough German lady, uh, never overweight, always physically active. She lived to be 96 uh, and ha had a good life. I went to see my doctor when I was 74 for my routine checkup. I always had elevated cholesterol and had to take pills for that. I, and I had some high, high blood pressure, not terribly high, but enough to take pills for. He said, yeah, you've still got those same problems. But he said, you're insulin resistant. I said, what? Yeah, he said, your fasting blood sugar is uh, 111. I said, that's not bad. He said, your fasting blood sugar should be no more than 90. He said, that means you are insulin resistant, and that is 
pre-diabetes. Aha, Rolf, wake up. Your dad became diabetic when he was 74. I'm 74. Am I going to allow that to happen? The most I ever weighed in my life was 170. At that time, I weighed 162 when he told me I was insulin resistant. I lost 12 pounds on purpose, 150 pounds, and changed how I ate. And uh, here I am. Uh, my fasting blood sugar has dropped down. It's not quite as good as it should be. But we have to know those things. And uh, if your doctor doesn't uh, answer that question to you, you need to pin them down and find out. Because what is insulin resistance and diabetes and you know what the incidence of insulin resistance is in the United States? It's 25 to 40 percent. People don't know that they have it unless they uh, have blood tests to track it down. So, uh, now, what does that cause? It contributes to what's called the dysmetabolic syndrome, the connection between all these problems, heart disease, diabetes, and the newest worry is fatty liver disease. What happens when you have too much sugar in your system? And it may be just my own uh, elevated uh, insulin resistance. Well, I'll go back to my father's story. He became insulin dependent, diabetic. diabetic. And then he developed esophageal varices, which is bleeding. And uh, his, his wife, my mother, with Alzheimer's, called from Arizona. They were down there and said, I can't wait, Daddy, out. Uh, oh, well, do you have anybody there with you? No. He said, call the ambulance, take him to the hospital. It turned out he had esophageal varices. He had been bleeding in his stomach. Okay. Why did he have esophageal varices? Because he had fatty liver disease that had advanced. Because of his diabetes and the fact that his sugar had been elevated, uh, created extra fat. Because the body takes that glucose, that sugar, from diabetes, and the liver turns it into fat. Now, that stores the fat, but the trouble is it clogs up the liver, and the liver is designed to take care of all of the poisons and so many other things for us. My dad died in liver failure at age 78 because of his fatty liver disease. Okay. I don't want any part of that. Furthermore, uh, it used to be, well, if you had cirrhosis of the liver, you were an alcoholic. Now a lot of it now is nutritional. Uh, that does not mean that you should drink alcohol, because alcohol is still a poison for your liver and for your brain. So, um, go back to one slide. So, these things are all connected. Coronary artery disease, stress, uh, increased risk of infection. COVID comes along. A lot of people with medical problems did not survive their COVID because of those medical problems. And toxic exposures, um, alcohol, but other toxins, and we'll talk about that. And head injuries, all these things contribute to brain disorder. Okay. Um, so, our brains are so amazing. But one thing that we now are very aware of is our brains are, will respond to our efforts. We can train our brains. If you think about if you had a bad habit, say you were a smoker, and you, uh, do you just say, well, I'm just going to have one, and that's going to be it? That's like me in a, in a potato chip. You give me a potato chip, and I'll eat the entire bag, uh, because it's, uh, it's addicting. 
alcohol is a dead thing. But all these things uh, can be a problem. We can change that by taking control with our brain. So, what do I do? I don't buy the potato chips. Then I can't reach in the bag and have one when I walk by. Uh, we can make a difference. Uh, and neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to change and to get excited about things. One of the things that drives me being up here is, number one, to get the message to people. But number two, it makes me feel good. My brain has to be tested to get up here and do what I'm doing. Some of it becomes automatic, but some of it comes from homework. Uh, yesterday when Lorena and I went over all the slides again to make sure that we say the right things. The biggest problem is getting me to talk fast and get through everything. So, but we'll, we'll continue to try. Are we okay so far? We're good, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, our brains can do so much because it controls our actions and our reactions and our movement. And we need to control it. Next. So, what do we do to help our brains and our bodies make us healthier? Okay. Physical exercise is number one. It does not mean it's the only thing. And is it totally the most important? All of the six pillars are important. Uh, but if you take one, it is physical exercise. Does that mean you've got to go to the health club and exercise? No. What it means is you need to keep moving. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Uh, don't just sit there and watch television. And if you have limitations, uh, uh, the physical limitations, you find ways. You work, uh, you go to the YMCA or a health club. Uh, you have, uh, if you're blessed to have a, a, a mate that uh, you're around, uh, the two of you start tackling these things. I was, I, I still run, which I need to, because it clears the cobwebs out of my brain. And I think it does make a difference. But when I say I run, most people say it, it isn't really a run, it's sort of a fast walk. Uh, uh, and I uh, acknowledge that. Uh, but keep moving. Good example. Uh, activities of daily living. What are things important that we have to do as we age? Being able to sit up and s sit down. Getting in and out of the chair. Uh, going up and down the stairs. If it's safe, uh, you have handy ra hand rails. I'll tell you, I put my hands on the railing every time I go up and down the stair. Uh, is my balance good? Well, I tend to forget about my balance until I lose it. And you don't <laughs> want to lose it because that goes to the uh, sixth pillar. Is and um, although this is part of this pillar too. Falling is never allowed. So what you do has to be done safely. And this goes back to knowing yourself, knowing what's weak and what doesn't work. And one of the handouts does have uh, some simple exercises that uh, knock on wood will work. And I talked to uh, 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 a couple of gentlemen here earlier and uh, talked about doing the exercises for their knees that I took care of uh, one of them for. He said, you've got to keep doing those things. Uh, the good news is, in our age group, you only have to do these things for the next 30 years. <laughs> uh, uh, so, what does physical exercise do? It directly stimulates your brain. Your muscles, by being exercised, put chemicals out that come from the muscles into the bloodstream. That stimulates other muscles to work, to wake up and exercise, but stimulates your brain. Studies show that BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that comes from your muscles, stimulates your brain. 
and it causes your brain to form better connections of one cell to another, and it uh, gives you uh, some new brain cells to form. It used to be thought our brains didn't change once you were 25. Uh, you weren't going to learn anything, you weren't going to do anything. That's not true. Uh, we, can, we can remember what we had for breakfast yesterday. Don't ask us for what we had for breakfast uh, two weeks ago, if, if we, unless we have the same thing every day. Uh, so, uh, so extra physical exercise slows aging of the body and the brain. And it makes your bones stronger. It help, it's healthy for your heart, as long as you're doing it at the right level. Uh, if you have never walked outside, uh, you may want uh, you check with your doctor. Uh, check, and if there's any question about what you're doing, you see a physical therapist. You get started, get started, and then do things with somebody else. It's great when I'm out running on the Fox River Trail to see these ladies walking along. Not only are they exercising because they're walking, but they're talking so fast and they're talking with their hands. And uh, <laughs> I say, that's awesome. Uh, you're not only are you exercising your heart and your legs, you're exercising your brain and you're exercising the rest of your body. We can make a difference. So find a team that you can do things with. Uh, and Annie and I learned that with her Parkinson's disease. Uh, the two of us would exercise together, and we found ways to really make a difference. Uh, so it boosts our energy, it helps our mood, and it helps us fight infections. Our in immune systems, our defense mechanisms in the body work better. So get active, make things happen. Next. To do all this, you need fuel, because your muscles need energy. They need fuel. Uh, and your heart needs it. And your brain needs it, because your brain uses 20% of the food that you eat, the energy that you have. 20%. It only weighs two to three pounds, but it's working 24 hours a day. Uh, so, we are what we eat. We need to supply our, brain, our bodies with healthy fuel sources. There are three main categories of fuel for our brains. One is carbohydrates, sugars and starches coming from plants and, uh, and fruits. Uh, the problem is the simple sugar uh, supplies energy, but doesn't give you other nutrients unless that plant uh, has other nutrients in it. Uh, the other source of carbohydrates are grains, and uh, the grains, unfortunately, sometimes really will irritate our gastrointestinal tracts. And uh, uh, there are people that have uh, ulcerative colitis and things like that, that are really made worse by some of those substances. So uh, it's a complex, uh, we could talk for an hour, Lorena, I'm sure, uh, but uh, so that's another talk. But uh, fuel is very important. Uh, and if you're talking about the diabetes and the overweightness and the obesity, we have to control how many calories we're eating, and what kind of foods we are eating. Uh, I am, have become enamored with avocados and with salads. Uh, yes, I do need proteins, uh, and I need healthy fats. Lots of salmon. Uh, uh, doesn't have to be the expensive stuff. Uh, and uh, good, healthy seafood. So, uh, the fuels comes from, number one, the carbohydrates, number two, the uh, fats, and uh, the fats can be wonderful. That's the salmon, uh, it's healthy oils, uh, and 
the, the fats supply a lot of energy. The other thing people forget when people say, well, you don't want fats because it gives you fat. No, fats don't give you fat. Carbohydrates taken in excess give you fat because the liver converts it to fat to store. Um, so um, some of these concepts may be a little bit uh, challenging, but uh, uh, they're, they are very important. The proteins can be converted to uh, fats or to uh, sugars, but you want your proteins to be used for structure, to build your uh, your heart, your muscles, uh, your liver, and, and things like that. Um, and the proteins are best if they're pasture raised and not fed in a feeding lot where everything is put in specifically to make the cattle grow fast and inexpensively. Uh, so, uh, next please. What are the brain boosting foods? What are really good? Green leafy vegetables are awesome. Uh, broccoli is awesome. Uh, Brussels sprouts is awesome. Good healthy oil. Coconut oil um, and uh, uh, Olive oil are, are both good. Coconut oil is better than olive oil, but, uh, but they're, uh, they're, they're both good. Avocados are superb. Lots of healthy fat and lots of good carbohydrate. Interestingly, coffee is good. Uh, uh, so I, I admit I have a couple of cups of coffee every morning. Dark chocolate is awesome. It is awesome. Uh, don't, uh, uh, the sweetened uh, uh, regular uh, uh, chocolate, stay away from, but the healthy uh, dark chocolate, yes. And the old, um, what's called omega-3 fatty acids, and this is your salmon and the healthy oils, uh, that's, that's what you want. And berries, berries are awesome, they're wonderful. One thing I've started to do uh, is, um, uh, have to put more fiber into my diet, which is good for your gastrointestinal, keeps the bowels working better. And um, if you get the starches uh, and you have good, healthy fruit, uh, no longer do I squeeze orange juice. I eat the entire orange except for the skin. Uh, and that fiber, uh, and the studies show, there's good fiber in it. Same thing with grapefruit. Uh, but even better are the, uh, uh, the berries, the strawberries, the blueberries. And uh, the fortunate thing is they are available now. Uh, so next. OK. We've done the uh, exercise. And we've done, covered briefly, the uh, diet and nutrition. Cognitive stimulation. Stimulate your brain in its thinking. Okay. Exercise stimulates your brain. Thinking about what you're eating and choosing and reading about what you should eat stimulates your brain. So this helps cognitive stimulation. So physical activities help. Studying what you're doing. Gardening, dancing, keeping moving, moving stimulates <coughs> not only your body, but your brain. Uh, certain activities, music, art, theater. If you, if you play the piano, keep playing it. If you keep doing things musically, if you're involved with a play reading group. Uh, Anne was in a play reading group for many, many years, and it was, it was so good for her brain. Uh, lifelong learning. Uh, Figure out something. Talk to people. And the socialization of talking to people is so important. That's what's great for, for me being here and seeing all you people. Uh, this has a uh, great benefit. Uh, and if you, if you don't know what to do, join a service group. Uh, meet with people. 
have friends, and talk about things. And the third, or at the real bottom here, and this is, might be on the bottom, but it is critically important, uh, and that's the spirituality involved, the religious support. Annie with her Parkinson's disease, uh, we learned ways to turn a bad day into a good day. There's no doubt she had Parkinson's for 45 years because it started the day she lost her sense of smell. It probably had been brewing even then. So, eventually, how'd she walk? Uh, like this. We tried to get her out of that habit. She fell three times in one year. Three broken ribs, three months later, fell on the driveway. We were walking out to look at flowers. She tripped on a crack on the sidewalk, and with that crack, her head hit the pavement. She's out cold. I'm standing right with her. I had a hold on her loosely, but I could, did not control her. Okay, she's breathing. She's laying two-thirds on her stomach. Ah, she's got a good pulse, but she's unresponsive. I look for a neighbor to call 911. Nobody's out. My cell phone's in the house. I watch her for about three minutes, run in, get my cell phone, and call 911. Ten minutes later, you can hear the ambulance coming. By this time, she's starting to moan a little bit. I say, Annie, can you hear me? Uh, he said, don't move, don't move. Are you having any pain? No. Okay, I said, uh, one thing. I said, move your fingers. And she goes like this, and I think, oh, that's good. I said, move your feet, and she goes like that. She said, don't move. I felt her neck. I said, did you hurt your neck at all? No. She said, don't move. The ambulance is here. Uh, she saw a neurosurgeon had imaging studies that showed she had a bleed in her brain, she had a skull fracture, uh, stayed overnight in the intensive care unit. Next day they re-scanned her, the bleeding had stopped, she was neurologically totally intact, they said you can take her home. Uh, the only issue that she thought was critical, and this tells you how feisty she could be, she said, well, I, I need to start driving the car again. The neurosurgeon said, you can't drive the car for six months, and then you have to have a doctor's permission. She said, my husband's a doctor, he'll sign the permit. <laughs> I said, no way. It breaks the law. And quite frankly, that was one of the cognitive impairment things that she had. She did not have good judgment. Uh, and so you, you have to deal with those issues, and we did. And we had three kids that uh, said, Mom, you can't do it. My, she said, your dad took my driver's license away. <laughs> I was a bad guy. Okay. It was better having her around. Okay, so she falls. That's the two falls. The third fall, we have somebody scheduled to start being with her on a Thursday in October. And I had to, I was still working full time, pretty much, uh, and uh, and she could walk. And I said, "Be careful! I'll be home at noon." I was in the operating room. Uh, my cell phone was in the locker, and uh, she fortunately had a push button. She went into the laundry room. I had told her no laundry. She fell and broke her hip. Okay, set back. Yes, big time. Uh, because with Parkinson's, any time you have an insult like that, it slows things down. So, uh, after lots of therapy and everything else, I said, and I tried working with her a lot, and by this time we have somebody with her full time, and I am working part time, so we've got intensive care. Uh, she still use a walker like this. That didn't make her safe. The walker can't adapt to her needs. It protects her. So, so Annie, starting tomorrow morning, we're going to try a new plan. We're going to get rid of the walker. I am going to become your walker. 
So next morning we stand up, or I stand up, cut her dress, she sit down on the side of the bed. Okay, Annie, we're gonna, it's 90 feet to the kitchen table. We're gonna learn how to walk there without the walker with better balance. So I put, I said, I'm gonna put your arm. And she said, you don't have to hold me. I said, I'm not holding you, I'm your insurance policy. Because if you start to fall, I can't catch you. So, falling is never allowed. Don't ever forget that, because it applies to all of us all the time. Never, ever allowed. I know of two friends who were in their early 80s, socially active gatherings, both fell, hit their head, blood in their brain, or were dead within two weeks. Oh, it can't happen. Falling is never allowed. It has to be prevented. It doesn't mean you sit in a chair and do nothing. It means you find the things that are safe. So what do we find with Annie? I got my hand on her arm. I say, okay, Annie. Uh, count of three, we're both going to take a big step with the left, big step with the right, and take, keep taking big steps, standing up tall. One, two, three, left. We both take a big step with the left. Right, I take a big step and she takes a half a step. Left. Stop. You can't do that. The stopping, the, the shuffling is your Parkinson's brain taking charge of your brain. Let's train your brain to walk. Within a month, we are walking to the kitchen table, most of the time without stopping, without shuffling, with me holding loosely on her arm, and we're talking. Within three months, we're walking entirely around the block, a quarter of a mile. Now, sometimes we had to stop. I'd carry a little chair and she'd sit. And once in a while, she'd start to shuffle. The second she starts to shuffle, that's the bad habit. She can't help it because her Parkinson's brain. But we trained her brain to work around it. Now, does that work for everybody? I don't know. But I know it worked for Ann. We went nine years without a fall at home. We kept her at home. And uh, yes, was I always there for her? Yeah, okay. Did that take away our independence? I don't think it did. Uh, it built the two of us being together in socialization. So uh, you, you have to do that. I see you're advancing the slide to get me moving fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he knows me well. <laughs> okay, uh, but I'll go back to one thing because I want to do the spirituality. Yeah. We could turn a bad day into a good day by things. If she wasn't moving well, put Neil Diamond on and we got the music. And we would literally prance together you know, with the music. Uh, we sit in chairs facing each other. And uh, uh, put your arms up. Yep. Just keep moving, moving, moving. And if things were not going well, we would find a way to turn the day around. One day, we couldn't turn it around. She was emotionally down, depressed. So was I. Uh, I learned very rapidly early on, she can't help what her brain is doing. I have to allow that to happen, but I have to find a way to change it. Not say, you can't do that. Substitute something. So, we couldn't that day find anything to substitute. So we went to bed, snuggled up, said, I love you, Annie. And she said, I love you too, honey. I said, we had a crappy day, didn't we? She said, it sure has been. I said, we're going to make tomorrow better. We're going to make all of our days better. And I had never prayed out loud. When I went to bed at night, I quietly said the Lord's Prayer. I snuggled up to her, and I said, Our Father, who art in, and with that she joined me in the Lord's Prayer, out loud. We got done with the prayer, the Lord's Prayer. 
And I said, God, you have so eminently blessed Annie and me. You've given us life on this wonderful earth. You've given us wonderful parents. Most of all, you've given us each other. You've always been there for us. I said, today we had a bad day. <coughs> and Annie and I are committed to making all the rest of our days better. And with your continued love, we will do that. We never had a bad day for the next two and a half years until she took her last breath. Never had a bad day. The prayer, we pray every night out together, every night. The spiritual aspect is over, so critical, and um, it, it made a huge difference. So, uh, is this number four? No. Yeah. Number five. Okay. So, uh, number slot five is sleep. Sleep is critically important because sleep cleans your brain up every night. Your brain has accumulated all sorts of memories that you don't need to memorize. Your brain has a lot of capacity to learn and to do things, but it's not totally unlimited. And so, uh, you can remember things you have to remember, and you can forget them. And what happens is they get wiped out in your brain when you have a good night's sleep. And that does make a huge difference. The other thing is, if you have, if you are really worried about something and you have a good night's sleep, the next day you wake up and you feel sort of energized, and you say, you know, I guess that wasn't such a bad thing I was worried about. Uh, and I have experienced that. Sleep is, is so important. If we don't sleep well, uh, and you, if, you, if you're not sleeping well, uh, consider having an evaluation of your sleep with somebody. Uh, because there are things that can be done. And it's not taking a sleeping pill. Uh, so, uh, the, um, so, sleep washes out the toxins and the po poisons that we get in our brain from our me bad memories and from uh, things that we have accumulated from what we ate. And it clears up the uh, memories. Uh, Always uh, adequate sleep keeps you mentally sharp. Uh, I slept pretty well. I didn't sleep super well. Yesterday I slept so well and uh, I was just energized. Uh, and people who don't get enough sleep tend to eat too much. And you don't want to do that. And uh, if you're tired because you didn't sleep well, then you find an excuse not to be physically active. So uh, uh, these things are all interrelated. Next. So where are the tips? Uh, it takes practice. Uh, you establish a, a sleep schedule. Keep your room cool. Uh, uh, look for a bedroom temperature of about 65 degrees. Avoid naps during the day if you can. That's not to say that it's, it's bad. Uh, periodically I'll have a nap for a half hour. Uh, but. Uh, don't rely on the sleep during the day, especially if you're having problems sleeping at night. It's good to get the bed at the same hour, but to, to get the habit of uh, getting to bed and saying, I'm not going to worry. Plus, uh, you don't watch TV in bed. You don't read books in bed. Uh, one thing I've learned is I wake up and uh, have to go to the bathroom and uh, uh, some nights I'll say, well, I'm wide awake. I'm not too sure I'm going to fall asleep. I get a book that uh, I'm interested in reading, and I get on the couch, and I start reading. Half hour, 45 minutes later, I fall asleep. The second that happens, I put the book down, quietly get back in bed. And don't think about what you were reading. Take a couple of good deep breaths and say, let's sleep. That can be done. Um, so, and alcohol, bad. Uh, caffeine, bad. So have your caffeine before noon in the day, and not no caffeine thereafter. And alcohol, avoid as much as possible. And it does not help to have a cocktail before bed or in the evening, because that will wake you up. 
an hour after you fall asleep. So, and the last one, avoid toxins, poisons, illness, and injuries. Uh, because they are major setbacks, and Anne proved that to me every time. Every time she had a urinary tract infection, her Parkinson's got worse. And uh, I have a friend who had a terrible bladder infection, urinary tract infection, he was in the hospital, had Parkinson's disease. It took a year for him to come back to get his Parkinson's under control. So other illnesses need to be uh, dealt with and controlled. Uh, obviously, uh, illnesses, it's hard to avoid them. But if we do everything with a healthy diet, exercise, uh, and uh, getting a good night's sleep, behaving ourselves, we can usually uh, avoid a, a lot of illness. Uh, toxins. Uh, there are all sorts of bad things in our environment. Uh, Roundup, uh, the weed killers, terrible, terrible, terrible. Uh, probably, uh, who knows what triggered Ann's Parkinson's disease. Most of the Parkinson's disease we're seeing, seeing right now are either the combination of a genetic sensitivity to some product and to those toxins that we have. Uh, it's, it's just ludicrous that these toxins have not been banned. Uh, you know, when you drive down in uh, August and September by the cornfields and you say, wow, is that corn growing well? Yeah, uh, and what have they put on it? Uh, uh, when they put it on, on uh, certain toxins that kill the weeds and make it more uh, productive. So, uh, we, we need to avoid that as much as possible. And alcohol is a toxin to our brain and our body. So, uh, so. I think, yeah, we're good. Um, yeah. Do we have any questions for Dr. Lula specific to the pillar? Looking at this about the foods, it talks about avoiding dried fruit. Have dried fruits and avoid gluten, so those are bad. But in the bottom of this sheet, it says butter and heavy whipping cream is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a nightmare to get talking about food. Uh, I, I have taken charge of what I do for myself. Uh, repeat again what, what your, your last sentence. The butter and heavy whipping cream that's underneath there is Okay. Uh, I put heavy whipping cream on all my coffee. Uh, and it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it's healthy it's healthy fat. It is the healthy fat. And uh, you gotta remember our brains are sixty to seventy percent fat. Our brains are loaded with cholesterol. Uh, now, should you eat a lot of cholesterol? No. But having some cholesterol is fine because our brains need that sort of stuff. People say, well, what diet, what, um, diet should you follow? Mayo Clinic says, do the Mediterranean diet. That's the simplest thing to do. Okay. Is the Mediterranean diet perfect? No. Uh, is it as good as anything is out there? Probably so. Uh, is it individually the right thing for you as an individual? That's what counts. Uh, so the Mediterranean diet is the simplest thing, and there's a couple of other diets that are very, very closely related to it. I like to go to the basics. So I use the, the salmon. Lots of salads, lots of healthy vegetables, lots of healthy fruits. And just try to stick with that as best you can. But you need to keep exercising. Uh, now there's a uh, 
there are some other fancy little dials, um, but they're for individuals. And, uh, so, well, we, we got some handouts some on some of the, so. so we have a specific brain nutrition handout that we can give if you're interested. Specifically to your question about dried fruits, um, they're, not, they're not bad, although overconsumption can be bad of the dried fruits just because they have a constipation factor. Um, I can attest to that. My daughter loves, loves the dried mango at Costco, and they come in this bag like this bag. Well, she repeatedly gives herself stomach aches because she eats too much of the dried mango. So you just have to be careful with the dried fruits. We know, you know, that's okay to have some of that once in a while because it is fruit, but it's just that constipation factor. So we put it on there with um, just in moderation. And we do a 45 minute presentation on nutrition. We found our community really has a lot of questions as we age. What foods are we supposed to be eating? You know, you hear one thing that margarine is good and then the next it's not. Coconut, coconut oil is good for you, but now it's not, you know? So there's so much to nutrition that we want to um, bring that up to the community. So we would be happy to come back and do a nutrition PowerPoint for you all. Because there's, like Dr. Lula said, you can, you really need to dive into it to answer all the questions and, and really get into it. So, yeah. What do you think about, I uh, can't believe it's not butter? Mm. What, what's in it? I'd have, I, I'd have to look at the nutrition oh. aspect. Well, I had a neighbor whose doctor told him, don't eat butter, but mm -hmm. eat the, can't believe it's not butter. It well, uh, number one, margarine is bad. There's I don't know if it's margarine. Is yeah, it? and, so, and, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, doesn't say yeah, it on the yeah, container. Yeah, that's the thing. You've got to read the labels on these things, and then that doesn't give you all the answers. Uh, because if it's if it's what they put in there is bad, they'll call it something else. The classic is uh, corn syrup. Oh yeah. Okay, corn syrup is nothing but concentrated um, um, not glucose but uh, a fructose mm -hmm. fructose okay what's fructose it's what quote fruit sugar okay uh, corn when when they grind up the corn and process it uh, for their foods they turn it into corn syrup. This is fructose, concentrated fructose. Glucose is healthy if you don't have too much of it. Fructose is toxic to your liver. And what happens is the liver turns it into fat. And so that's the toxicity of it. It doesn't get metabolized the way it should. And so fructose is bad. So if it says corn syrup, avoid it. Uh, because what, what are the companies that make it? Uh, you put fructose in Coke. Uh, uh, hey, do I, do I like a Coke? Yeah, I haven't had a Coke for a year at least. Uh, now, will I have a diet soda once in a while? Yeah. The diet stuff is not good either and needs to be avoided. So uh, have some good, healthy water. Uh, uh. And Chris did hand out the nutrition PowerPoint that kind of talks about some good foods, explains it a little deeper. But the biggest thing is if you can't read the ingredient or pronounce it, most likely it's processed and it's unhealthy. So we like to focus on those whole foods, not unprocessed. Um, do you notice a lot of us older people have big bellies? I've noticed that you have no belly whatsoever. What do you do to avoid that? Keep my weight under control. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the, the big belly, the first reaction I have is, uh, this is fatty liver. Fatty liver. Now, it's not just your liver. But the abdomen, <laughs> abdominal fat, the deep abdominal fat, comes from the, the body is efficient. The body says, we're going to store energy. The trouble is, that interferes with 
the metabolism of sugars. It makes you more prone to insulin resistance, to fatty liver, liver failure. The only treatment for advanced fatty liver disease is a liver transplant. There's, when it gets to be bad, you've lost the battle. So it's either liver transplant or funeral. And uh, because the funeral's gonna come. And my dad was the victim of that. And we didn't understand that then. But I understand it now. Therefore, uh, cut out the alcohol. And my dad was never an alcoholic. He, sure, we'd have a family gathering and we'd have a Manhattan. Uh, but uh, there were a lot of days that we didn't have any alcohol. Uh, so uh, you have to do things in moderation. But more importantly, you have to know yourself and know what the science is today. And that's why I, uh, I, I expand this talk from talking about uh, neurological disease and talking about uh, brain health. We're talking about overall health. Because it doesn't do any good if your brain is working beautifully and you've got a liver that's dying or you have become insulin dependent because you're insulin resistance and you didn't tackle that. That's where you've got to keep moving. Burn up the calories. And Annie and I found ways to burn up a lot of calories. The problem is we need to get calories into her because when we got married, she was 125 pounds. When she was pregnant, every time she was 135 pounds. And when she got to be 90 pounds, I said, we got to feed your brain. Your brain is starving. And uh, so for the last two and a half years, I made smooth smoothies for her uh, and uh, loaded with protein, uh, loaded with good frozen fruits, uh, good um, uh, some frozen vegetables, and I could put all her medications in too, and we would time it so she'd get that. And it made a huge difference. But in the end, God took care of her. All of a sudden, her brain just failed. Now, the, the Parkinson's disease just took over, and what'd she do? She peacefully slept away at home over four days. And uh, that, uh, we knew it was coming. But when we think we got 45 years beyond when she was 36 and had her first Parkinson's exposure. So, uh, and hey, Parkinson's, is a, there are a million people in the United States right now. And why is that happening? If you go to Scandinavia where they don't use Roundup and toxins, they ban them. And the number of people with Parkinson's disease in Scandinavia is going down, 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 down. The rest of the world, it's going up, 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 up because uh, of Roundup and the toxins that they put into this stuff. The, the science is there, it's all politics. And of course the food industry and the chemical industry and the investors in those companies say, yeah, make more money, make more money, make more money. Uh, so. Other questions? You had your hand up first. Yeah, I did. Uh, coconut oil, isn't that the product that they use for uh, the popcorn machine in the movie theaters? Uh, it, may, it may be in some, some cases. Hey, coconut oil is healthy. Uh, now, I, I say that sort of um, with question with the quotation marks. Um, coconut oil, when well prepared, is wonderful. And you can buy concentrated coconut oil at uh, Target. You can buy it at Walmart. The good news about it is it's high energy and it's healthy energy. Contrasted to sugars, Coconut oil is like clean fuel. Sugars are not that clean of fuel. They're not bad because we need them. Our bodies take sugar and use it as our brains use it. But coconut oil uh, is a better fuel. 
reason I mention that is because wasn't it about 10, 15 years ago where the environmental wackos went crazy on the, on the oil from the movie theaters and you're supposed to have air cooked popcorn and all this other stuff and every oil and every fat is bad for you and, and uh, they threw off all kinds of stuff on that? Well, you know, I, I, I remember that. Uh, what is the issue with that, though? Uh, I know that coconut oil is great fuel. How do you do it? You've got to know how to use it. Uh, when I made Annie's smoothies, I put, I made um, four smoothies every other day. Each smoothie had uh, uh, enough so that he get 1,400 calories each day from the smoothie. And then we cheated. We went to McDonald's and got a strawberry shake at night because she loved the strawberry shake. But she needed the calories. That's what she needed. But when I made her smoothies, I put in uh, two tablespoons of concentrated coconut oil because it is such an effective fuel for the brain. Now, you got to be careful with that stuff. Uh, uh, when I was told about it and I read about it, and I said, yeah, this is great. And the person who told me about it said, there's only one side effect. You've got to be careful, unless you want disaster pants. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, one day, I took a tablespoon of it. Tasted fine. Five minutes later, I ran as fast as I could to the bathroom. And I didn't make it. <laughs> so uh, you, know, you, you have to uh, follow the rules. You have to understand. You have to know yourself. Uh, so. Do you do, does the Brain Center do presentations on dementia and Alzheimer's? Absolutely. Yeah. If you go to our website, we have all of our presentations that we have currently. And we keep adding and changing. So it'll as we continue to learn on more subjects. But yeah, if you visit there and go under community education, you'll see all of our different presentations. Uh, losing our mental sharpness is a real thing for all of us as we get older. Doesn't mean it's normal, but we're all different. And so we have to prevent mental deterioration if we can. Okay. That means keep yourself in good physical shape. Uh, make sure that your metabolism is good, that you're not diabetic or you're controlling. Control your weight as much as you can. But keep moving, 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 because it does stimulate your brain. Uh, and uh, concentrate on all the components. And uh, so I paid attention. And there's phenomenal books out now. And some of them are pretty complex as far as because they're designed more for physicians and stuff like that. But um, you, you get down to the simple things. Uh, leave here with uh, uh, knowing the six pillars, knowing uh, that uh, you need to take charge of your brain. Uh, and, uh, they mentioned Prevagen. Is yeah. that a good product? Uh, yes or no? The, the issue with Pre Prevagen is it's been available for about 10 years, 15 years. Uh, uh, people swear by it. Some people swear by it. Uh, there's no, knock on wood, there's no side effects to Prevagen other than your pocketbook. And uh, so, uh, uh, somebody said, people ask me, I say, if you've tried it and you like it and you don't mind paying the money for it, to the best of our knowledge, there's no side effects to it. And that's the key, is, is there a potential toxin or something like that. Beyond that, Dr. Luleff, a question on what Prevagen is for. Uh, Prevagen is for me to make you mentally sharper. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for to fight confusion, uh, to fight brain fog, stuff like that. Uh, I didn't think brain fog was a real thing until I had it. Yeah. You know, it, it's that mental sharpness that uh, uh, you think. And as I told the uh, uh, 
Lorena and uh, Chris, like I did. You know, I woke up this morning at five o'clock, wide awake. In fact, I, I sat down and wrote some, wrote some notes that I wanted to remember so I didn't forget them. Not for today, but just in, in our, our brain stuff. And uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm knee deep in writing the book of Anne's story because we learn so much. So the things that I demonstrated uh, that we could make a huge difference. You now, when uh, when she was diagnosed, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm finished. Oh, okay. Um, when she was diagnosed uh, in uh, 1989, she was 49. We left the doctor's office. We knew something was brewing, but she didn't know, and uh, she was devastated. Uh, and she, we sat in the car and she cried and I cried and hugged her and hugged her and uh, she said, my life is over. I'll never get to see our kids get married. I'll never get to see grandkids. They can't play tennis anymore. My life is over. I snuggled up to her and said, Annie, I love you dearly. I always have and I always will. You don't have to worry. I'll always be with you. We will always be in our own home together. Said, we've got wonderful kids. They'll be there for us. We've got wonderful friends. You've got wonderful friends. They will be. We'll find the best doctors, and we will find things to do. And we will <coughs> make a difference. And it's not your fault that you have it. It's not my fault. And God will be with us in fighting this damn disease because it's the disease that's the enemy and now we know who the enemy is and we can focus on it. When she took her last breath peacefully at home in a deep sleep, ah, we had seen all three kids get married four times. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we uh, got to know eight grandchildren the youngest was 11. The three oldest ones were in college. Oh. Okay. Nice. We got to see the things that she said she would never see. Okay. We made a difference. Okay. Life has challenges. We have a choice. We can deal with them. We can understand them. And we can make a difference. Sometimes we make a difference that is huge. Sometimes it wasn't ideal. I mean, there are bad diseases. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we, had, we went to a lot of funerals of people who died of cancer that were younger and vi more vibrant than we were. Uh, so we, we found a way to do it. And uh, I, I've done coaching with uh, people uh, that come in with a new diagnosis of Parkinson's. And they're devastated. And we talked for an hour and a half about just what we're talking about here in making a difference. And we can make a difference. Uh, and uh, we did. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, she's spiritually with me right now. Uh, this her, She did not die. Her physical presence changed, but she did not die. She's alive and well. And, uh, so we have a change. We have a choice. And, and we can do that. So. Can you recommend any um, herbal or vitamin things that you can get at a, a nutrition store? Since Prevagen isn't supposed to work, is there anything that a person could buy that would help memory? Ah. Uh. It, it's, it's hard to say because, number one, individual difference. Number two, placebo effect. Uh, if people, people that say, my private is just wonderful, well, to them it's wonderful. Does that mean that it's biochemically doing something in their brain that makes a difference? Uh, there, there are some nutritional things that are very important. And quite frankly, I'm not into all of that. Uh, Although I take some, uh, I take zinc, zinc, I take magnesium, and I take, uh, oh gosh, what's the uh, uh, Indi uh, Asian Indian uh, 
the, the yellow stuff. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, turmeric? Turmeric. Turmeric. Yeah. turmeric. Yeah. Uh, I take those. Uh, uh, some of the um, uh, good guru writers uh, will say, take a multiple vitamin, take a one a day vitamin. Uh, just, uh, they, they do it just to cover the bases in case they're missing something. Who knows? I, I mean, I, I, I've tried a couple of things. I don't know it's any different. I'll tell you, going out for a good walk and run to me is far more therapeutic than anything else I do other than talking to people. <laughs> so, say, selling what we were designed to do. We're designed to move our animals. We're, we're designed not to poison ourselves. Uh, but that's easy to say, it's not easy, not easy to do, especially in the environment today. With, uh, you know, one of the things, I, and I haven't brought it up, uh, the blue-green algae in the Fox River, that scum that you see, that all the lakes in Wisconsin have all something in August, uh, you don't want to uh, swim in it because you come out coated it, and if you put your dog in it, the dog if it drinks it, it may die. Okay, that blue-green algae has a neurotoxin uh, that's bad on your brain. If you go to Florida, you've heard of red tide. Red tide, you can smell it. Uh, uh, kills the fish. The fish eat the, uh, the uh, dolphins eat the fish, and they'll die. They will uh, beach themselves because their brain is all screwed up. Hmm. Uh, and that happened in Guam right after World War II. People were eating the big bats that they shot for food, and the bats fed ate the um, uh, seeds from the cyclad trees. The cyclad trees grew on the edge of the lagoons. The lagoons were loaded with blue-green algae. The blue-green algae has a neurotoxin. It got concentrated by the plants, got concentrated by the bats. And the people ate the bats, and they, got, they filled their brains. It did happen. So there are all sorts of things smoldering around. When I run the, on the East River Drive, on the uh, East River Trail in August, if I can smell the blue green algae, I don't I get, off, get away from it. Especially if it's the west wind, because it's blowing things on the board to the that side. Good to bear. If I want to incorporate the coconut oil into my diet, but I don't do smoothies, and it's like a solid form, how can you? <laughs> okay. Do with it. Well, you you can put uh, coconut oil uh, in, um, and you want to go real real careful with it. Uh, you do a teaspoon uh, with uh, BA juice. Uh, that's that's what I I I I would do if I had to do it. BA juice is pretty healthy stuff, and so you take a, a glass of that, and you put a teaspoon in, and do it twice a day. And uh, that, that should take care of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, coffee. Some people will yeah, dip it in their coffee because it melts. Oh, yeah. So if you drink coffee, that or a tea, maybe. Just give it a little flavor. Fried fish or eggs in it, but it has a very low burn. Um, it burns at a low, low temperature, so you just have to be careful that it doesn't burn your food. Then. Okay. There's other ways to cook with it. In your experiment, make sure you're near the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> you can use it to pop popcorn. Yeah. Pardon? Yes. Pop popcorn. Yes. I use it for, well, it for popcorn. Uh, yes. you know, I, it's not supposed to be popcorn. Yeah. I, I, I consider popcorn just like potato chips for me. <laughs> you know, if I have one handful, I guarantee if my hand is in the bag as soon as the one is in the mouth. And it's, it's bad. So I don't. Yeah. yeah, and I just want to say, so all of these are great questions, right? You probably have more that you'd love to ask. So that's what our coaching is about. It's very informal. You sit down, talk with Dr. Luloff, any of the other coaches about any of these questions around what we talked about today. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, we're going to hang out if you have more questions for any of us. If you don't mind filling out the survey, that would be helpful. 
and I'd be happy to be back to talk more about nutrition or any of, of the other topics. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.